problem and starts explaining a branch of mathematics in a movie by Spielberg, you know, <laughs> that is not a big mystery anymore, right? But it took 80 years or 90 years for these ideas to enter into the realm of philosophy, into the realm of, of, of people with ideas that are not necessarily professional mathematicians. Nevertheless, it took much longer for them to percolate into the Anglo-American world of philosophy than it took the, into the French world because Deleuze was there. Deleuze was there already writing books about Bergson, and Henri Bergson is a philosopher from the early 20th century who had a famous debate with Einstein and clearly was another, you know, if you have a debate with Einstein, you have to be a very famous philosopher. He lost the debate, which is one of the reasons why he may have lost his popularity, but nevertheless, um, Bergson was already toying with ideas from Poincaré. And so, Deleuze, having, wrote, having written a book on, on Bergson in the early 60s, Bergsonism, it's called, was in the per perfect situation to just walk by the mathematics department at the university where he taught, where he taught and hear about these ideas and talk to mathematicians about these ideas. Where are you guys going with this? Because in philosophical is very interesting. It's precisely the concepts of space that I need to conceive of that space of immanent, that immanent spirituality that I want to that I want to be able to grasp. But I need, you know, if, if, it's a, if it's a spiritual space that is not transcendent, how can we conceive of it? It needs to be imminent, you know. He was worried and he was like churning these ideas. At the same time, the disciples of Poincaré were putting the final touches on the theory. All the books were being published again. So Deleuze, to put it in a nutshell, was at the right place at the right time. And he stole... The, the, the show from the Anglo-American philosophers who today are entirely concerned with topology and entirely concerned with imminent patterns of becoming as, as they can be studied topologically, but they began doing it in the 90s. So he was there 30 years before. You know, if something is, the problem is, of course, that Anglo-American philosophers, you know, analytical philosophers, do not read continental philosophers, so they never really noticed that. I published a few articles in, in, in journals that they do read, trying to call attention to them, you know, trying to say, look, Deleuze was there 30 years before, and the analysis he did of these patterns of becoming are way more advanced than what you guys are doing right now. So you can dismiss everybody else. You can dismiss the every day. You can dismiss Lyotard. You can dismiss uh, Lacan. But don't even for a sec try to dismiss Deleuze. Because Deleuze was a human, just like many of you people are. I'm, I'm talking again to my imaginary analytical philosophers. You know? In other words, he's not an idealist, he's a materialist. He, 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 he admires the Anglo, and the, particularly the empiricist Anglo-American tradition. And, and, and his work has a lot in common with the American pragmatists as well as the British empiricists. Except that he has also benefited from the work of French mathematicians and French, French scientists who for a hundred years have been working precisely on the question of imminent patterns of becoming. Now what the space that Poincaré invented is called phase space. It's a more complex space than the little graphs that I wrote before and therefore allows itself much more to, 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 um, to create phase space, you need to do several things. Number one, identify the number of ways an object can change or an object can become. Or an object, a process. Remember, I'm using here the word become as synonymous with change. So identify the number of ways an object can change. Some objects can change only in a few, let me see, you have a space here. 
me give you a, a very, very simple example from, from, uh, from very early physics. This was, a, this was an example studied by Galileo. That's how old it is. It's a pendulum. Pendulum that can, of course, swing is pivot, is pivot here and can swing in either direction. Now, say that this is, the, oh, this is the system that we're trying to study. We're trying to figure out what patterns of becoming can a pendulum have. They are going to be very, very simple because pendula are very, very simple objects. Nevertheless, it will serve us to, 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 to introduce the ideas. A pendulum, when you, when you study it, can change in position. We know that. You can grab it here, move it up here, for instance. Right? And now, now the pendulum, you know, the fat part of the pendulum is up here, so now it's in a different position. You can also bring it up here, now it's in another different position. So that's one way in which it can change position. It can also change in speed. If I take the pendulum and move it up here and let go, it's going to start swinging, right? And as it swings, it will change speed. It will reach its maximum speed when it's down here. You know, when I, when I, before I, 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 I let go, it has zero speed, of course. Then I let go, it begins acquiring speed, it begins accelerating. It reaches its maximum speed here, begins decelerating until it goes to zero again. And then goes back again, back again. Every swing having less, reaching less, until it finally comes to a point, to, to a, to a, 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 to a rest, right? So it can change in speed. And those are, it's two axes of becoming, it's two dimensions of becoming, because a very simple logic can only change in two ways. Or at least we have identified the two ways. Now, you might, you might I'll get back to you in a second. You might think, well, wait a minute, a pendulum can, can change in many, many, many other ways. I can, for instance, right now take a can of spray paint and graffiti it, and bingo, that's changed. It changed in color. Or even better, I can ask Wiley Coyote to lend me one of his acne. You know, TNT uh, 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 explosives. I just take the TNT explosive and go like this, and the pendulum bow, blows into tiny little pieces. So it can also change by exploding. And yes, it can do. The question is, identify the number of ways that nobody can change by itself, not by you coming in with an axe and starting beating the crap out of it, you know, or, or decorating with little flowers. You, know, you, can, you can change the pendulum in a million other ways. The question is, how many ways can it change in its own dynamic? If you want to put it another way, in how many relevant ways can it change? Relevant to studying its own dynamics. A stick of dynamite next to the pendulum would be an irrelevant way of changing, or if you want to put it a different way, we have now created another system. The system stick of dynamite plus pendulum, it's not just the pendulum by itself. So you identify the number of ways an object can change. These are called its degrees of freedom, technically. Because our the the ways in which an object is free to become different. Number two, create a space with as many dimensions as degrees of freedom. So for the pendulum, it would be of course a two-dimensional space. This is why the pendulum is it's used a lot of times to illustrate this because you, don't, you can just draw the two-dimensional space and it's very simple. 